Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'm uh, overwhelmed, frankly, stunned when I heard, and uh, deeply grateful. Um, entomologists sometimes have uh, um, something of a, uh, I don't know, a, a complex about, uh, um, uh, well, sort of Rodney Dangerfield sort of uh, <laughs> not getting respect, and, uh, which extends to insects as well. So. This is well beyond um, anything I ever imagined. I'm very grateful to the committee, and I'm very grateful to USC for uh, hosting, and, and uh, grateful to everybody for coming. Um, OK, well, um, in supersize America, uh, bigger is generally regarded as better. And if uh, you have any doubt as to how pervasive this notion is, all you have to do is a Google search on the phrase, bigger is better, and you end up with about 145 million hits. By comparison, if you do a search on the phrase small is beautiful, which dates back to 1973, actually the year of the Tyler Prize uh, and growing environmental awareness, you end up with a, a lousy 30 million hits. Uh, and in fact, this obsession with bigness and betterness is at least in part why insects have a hard time um, getting the attention and appreciation of the, of the vast majority of Americans. <coughs> Uh, there are uh, living organisms on planet Earth span about 13 orders of magnitude from uh, uh, the largest whales that uh, weigh uh, up to 100 metric tons to tiny creatures that live in interstices between sand or these uh, water bears, tardigrades that live in drops of dew and, and uh, uh, clumps of moss. So among these orders of magnitude, insects span only about five of those 13. Uh, t toward the small end, at the uh, sort of extremes, you have sc uh, scarabaea, large uh, Hercules beetles uh, and stag beetles that can exceed 16 centimeters in length and weigh over 30 grams, about the equivalent of a mouse. And at the very smallest end, tiny little mimarid wasps called fairy flies that lay their eggs inside the eggs of other uh, insects weigh less than two tenths of a millimeter, are less than two tenths of a millimeter in length and weigh less than three one uh, tenths of a milligram. They basically are smaller than a single-celled amoeba, than a single-celled protozoan, and yet they're complete uh, insects. So they're on the small side of things. <laughs> it's not a surprise, then, that insects frequently are depicted in textbook food webs as sort of anonymous and interchangeable. Uh, here you have uh, the charismatic vertebrates. Each gets not just family names, but species names. There's a musk ox, a snowy owl, an arctic fox. Insects are kind of lumped in a box. Uh, <laughs> as uh, interchangeable and uh, not even worth identifying beyond the class level. And it's not that surprising, given that they really can be difficult to tell apart, even if you are an expert. Even entomologists sometimes refer to many groups of uh, uh, lepidopterans called microlepidopterans. They call them LBMs, which means little brown moths. And these are the <laughs> entomologists who are calling them that. So given that these little brown moths pretty much look interchangeable, how is it anyone could spend 35 years studying one species of little brown moth? Um, well, uh, it can be done, and uh, <laughs> I think it was worth doing, and uh, I hope I can convince you as well. Uh, really, the point is uh, that uh, this appearance is notwithstanding. Every insect species is unique and unlike every other insect species. Over the past 300 million years, insects have devised over a million different ways of making a living on planet Earth. There are over 900,000 plus species that have names that we know about. Uh, humans really could stand to learn a lot, a lot from them on uh, how to go about living on planet Earth uh, for the foreseeable future without causing chaos and mass disrup dis disruption. Now, uh, I couldn't help but notice that other animals have provided insights and metaphors for how to deal with challenges. So um, we've got fish, a remarkable way to boost morale and improve results. Here's Animals, Inc., a business parable for the 21st century. Horses don't lie. What horses teach us about our natural capacity for awareness, confidence, courage, and trust. And then whale done, power of positive relationships. Why not little brown moths? Can we learn something from little brown moths? Are they that much harder to relate to than a five-ton killer whale? It could even, I even thought of a title. You could call it Postcards from the Edge of a Leaf. <laughs> 
So I, I thought maybe the last 35 years could sort of be uh, presented and packaged as a, a series of uh, take-home lessons that uh, this little brown moth uh, perhaps can teach us. Uh, now, I'm a, a kind of an unlikely uh, spokesperson in some ways for little brown moths because I actually grew up um, terrified of insects. And my sisters here can attest to that fact. I think it dates back to an unfortunate encounter when I was seven years old in our family grapevine, um, uh, running into what I later, years later, uh, decided must have been a pellid nota beetle, um, which caused me to run into the house screaming and terror. It was a lot bigger than I thought it would be. And then I scrupulously avoided insects, even though I loved biology, really wasn't very comfortable with insects. Um, but I knew I wanted to be a biologist, so uh, I went to Yale as an undergrad, and Tommy Bourgeois, who's the class secretary of the class of 75, is here, who can attest to the fact I was there. And uh, shout out. To, um, and uh, I had placed out of introductory biology from AP credit and, and was uh, therefore allowed to take an upper level course, and the only one that fit my schedule was one called Biology 42B, Terrestrial Arthropods, which I knew had something to do um, with insects, but I thought, okay, fear stems from ignorance. I'll take this course and I'll, I'll learn which ones I should be afraid of. And uh, <laughs> ended up uh, being absolutely um, smitten um, as a result of the uh, brilliant uh, classroom instruction of Dr. Charles Remington, who also actually uh, offered research opportunities, and he was a, a major uh, force in, in, in my life, and I, Yale did, in fact, change my life. But the story is, a, is an impor important for another reason. It's that uh, many of my, m my career decisions uh, stemmed from a deep flaw in my character, and that is uh, basically I'm afraid of a lot of things, a lot of things that can hurt you. And I actually became interested in insects because I was determined to overcome that fear with, with knowledge. And fear enters into many important uh, uh, choices I've made over the years. While I was an undergrad, um, Dr. Remington had invited a Cornell professor to give a lecture. Uh, Dr. Paul Feeney came to t talk about his research on patterns of host plant use by swallowtail butterflies, beautiful, charismatic, colorful butterflies. And uh, at this lecture, there was another uh, so a moment of epiphany, and uh, Paul Feeney talked about an idea that had been published in, uh, in the literature about 10 years earlier by two former uh, Tyler Prize laureates, uh, Peter Raven, who uh, won in 1994, and Paul Ehrlich, who won in 1998. And this was the idea that uh, there is a, a pattern of reciprocal adaptive evolution between plant feeding insects and the flowering plants they consume, which collectively account for about half of all living species on terrestrial Earth. Uh, so their idea was that plants, uh, by mutation or other genetic event, evolve novic to novel toxic chemicals. Plants are rooted to the ground, can't run away from their enemies, so instead depend on poisons to deal with them. Uh, when they are freed from their insect her, uh, enemies, they, are, they, are, they can then uh, diversify, uh, undergo what's called an adaptive radiation, and uh, move into new uh, niches that, they, that were uh, otherwise available. Until such time as by mutation or other genetic event, insects evolve the novel mechanism of resistance to circumvent those poisons, allowing them to diversify and ultimately insult to injury using the erstwhile toxins uh, to recognize their own specific host plants. So this was a very satisfying concept uh, because uh, these escalating cycles of chemical defense and insect circumvention accounted not only for the tremendous diversity of plant toxins, and plants make hundreds of thousands of different chemicals. You probably enjoyed some at lunch, as a matter of fact. Um, <laughs> but also the extraordinary richness, species richness of flowering plants and the insects that eat them.